God bless you, church. Good to see you this morning. Today, I, w I want to uh, present a prophecy that was given uh, by a man. His name is Kent Christmas. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, I've heard him give a few words before, and it's uh, pretty on fire and uh, accurate. But I want to present this because... I want you to hear a couple of things that he's saying that will kind of boost the church. And he kind of follows some of the, the items that I uh, have given word in through the past uh, couple of months. So we're going to uh, present this word to you this morning. It's 16 minutes long. So just listen Take in what he has to say, because some of the things he's saying are very valid and encouraging and strengthening for us as a body of believers. The Lord said that what we have been experiencing in this nation for the last year has been of the enemy because he sees what God is getting ready to do to him. The Lord says that the social distancing that has been in this nation has been the enemy trying to shut the church down and to make God's people distant from each other. Because thus saith the Lord, I'm getting ready to cause demon spirits to have to social distance. And the Lord says that demon spirits have been strong in this nation is because they've run in packs and they have come together and, and they have protected each other. And God said, I'm getting ready to isolate demons that have been in this nation for decades. And the Lord says, as I begin to isolate them, they will no longer be able to draw strength from each other. And God said, the spirit of fear that settled on this nation because of the spirit of COVID that came upon this country. The Lord says, I am now loosing a spirit of fear upon hell. And God said, even as the enemy has put a mask on the church to shut her mouth. The Lord says, I am now putting a mask on the mouth of the enemy. And God says, the lying spirits that have been in this nation have come against the people of God and have loosed a spirit of fear upon this nation. God says, now I'm going to do to the devil and to hell what they have done to the church. And the Lord said, I am loosing a spirit of fear upon the enemy. And God says, as I loose the spirit of fear upon demonic strongholds that have ruled and reigned over this nation, that God says there is going to be a trembling and a shaking hit the very strongholds of hell as the spirit of God begins to move. And God says that I have allowed the enemy to shut down the church. But the true church of the Lord never was silent. For God said, I heard your cry, though you could not come together and though it looked like you were dead God said I have left my spirit as a resident seed in the house of the Lord and the houses that have made room for me saith God not only are they going to come back alive but God said I'm getting ready to loose a growth spurt upon the house of the Lord and God says those that have tried to come against my house those that would not stand for my word those that backed up and drew back from the hand of God. God said as the house of the Lord looks like it has been embarrassed, so am I going to embarrass the enemy. The Lord says I have voices that I have raised up in this hour that nobody's ever heard of. I have saved them as an Elijah spirit. But God says that there is a voice getting ready to rise up, not only in this nation, but there is a voice, saith God, that is getting ready to come forth around the nations of the world and the very strongholds of the enemy that have put a clamp on thy earth, saith God, I am breaking. For the very strongholds of hell that have been in the heavenlies have marshaled together because they know what I'm getting ready to do. Starting in the year 2021, I loosed my glory back into the earth and I am reversing everything that hell tried. It will not be successful, saith the Lord. And though there will be houses that will shut down, I will allow them to be shut down because they never made room for me and I never birthed 
birth them, saith God. But for every house that would not recant, that would not bow down, that was not intimidated by the spirits of hell, I now loosen authority upon you, saith God, and all that my word has declared shall come to pass. My word will not return in me void, saith God, for I am not a man that I should lie, and I do not repent, saith God. And those that have stood and declared my name, I will not let them down, saith the Lord. For thus saith the Lord, I have raised prophets up in this day who have not shunned the word of God, but all that they have declared shall come to pass. Soon, saith the Lord, I am coming back to get my church. And when I come back, saith God, the place that I have choose, chosen to meet my bride for the first time is in the heavenlies. And the Lord says, I am now for the next four years going to begin to clear out the heavens because hell is congregated in the heavens to try to stop the reunion of the bride and the bridegroom. And for the next four years, saith God, every stronghold that's been in this nation, I am now supernaturally going to begin to cause them to bow down to the name of Jesus Christ. For this is my hour, saith the Lord, and the enemy will not stop, saith God. And though in the heavenlies for a long time, the last time God says I moved in this nation as I wanted to was in the 50s when I loosed the healing revival. But know this, saith God, not only is there a healing revival coming out of the heavenlies into the house of the Lord, but there is a revival of the casting out of demons. For years, saith God, the house of the Lord has been silent, and demons have set in my people in the house of God. But know this, saith the Lord, I am not coming back for a church that is decrepit or is bound by spirits. So this night, saith the Lord, even in this sanctuary, I bind every demon spirit of sickness. I bind every spirit of perversion. I bind every spirit of adultery. I bind every spirit of homosexuality. I bind the spirit of cancer. I bind the spirit of arthritis, saith God. For now, saith the Lord, I am loosening a river of divine healing in this sanctuary, saith God. On this side, saith God, there is a wave of healing, saith the Lord, that is beginning to sweep across this sanctuary. Know this, saith the Lord. I am the God that healeth thee. Rejoice, saith the Lord, for this is not another hour in which you will be disappointed, but this is the hour, saith God, that the glory, the glory, the glory, the glory of God arise, O church, and shine, for this is thy day. I will never move again in the earth like I'm getting ready to move, says the Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Church, um, the reason I wanted to play this is to express to you that we're not alone. We walk together, united, with other bodies of believers, other men and women of God. And God, as he spoke through Kent, I believe he was speaking to me and to you. I sense that uh, some of these words that he brought out were uh, a validation of what I'm seeing the Lord do. And uh, as we look and see what he talked about in regard to COVID, this is a demonic entity that is spread across, across the earth. It has uh, been brought out through the hands of demonic people. And this coming to pass has caused havoc on the church and has brought a spirit that is not God's spirit. It's a spirit of fear. We as a body of believers must see that the spirit of fear is something that will gr grip your emotions. <clears throat> and as it grips your emotions, it begins to take over your thought life. 
And once it takes that uh, and, and sets boundaries in your life, it begins to bring you to a place where you bow to the fear. We're not going to have that anymore. We're going to fight. And we must be a body of believers that learn that the enemy isn't here to play. But through these words, he said that he was going to, God is going to stop the demonic voices and the demonic spirits. And he was bringing in an Elijah spirit. That means the, the 14 miracle man is coming to the forefront. The 14 miracle woman is coming to the forefront and God is going to flow through you. I'm talking you. There are going to be the unknowns that are not even going to be known, but they will operate in an anointed fashion. He also said that in the next four years that uh, there will be a transformation of a new wave of power that's coming on the church. He's bringing also, he says later on, I didn't play all of it, but he talks about how we are going to receive the uh, uh, reaping harvest of the move of God wherein we are going to overtake the reaper. He didn't say that, I'm saying that. And we're going to operate where God will begin to establish in your homes new authority. He also said that he, God, was going to begin to deliver our children that have gotten tied up in homosexuality. This spirit has brought the church to a standstill. And where we've gone with that is we now are so careful that we do not call out the demonic because of fear that we'll get ostracized. The Lord's giving me a sermon on this very subject of ostracization. I can't even pronounce it right now. But removing us from society because of our voices. We can't allow that. We must be voices that speak forth the truth and are willing to do what it is that God wants us to do. I believe in the deliverance of the lost, the deliverance of the sinner, the deliverance of the homosexuals, the deliverance that God's going to bring in this coming hour. <clears throat> and he said that the glory of God is going to fall upon the house of God from 21 to 24. I believe that. The Lord is removing demons and sending angels. We will not need to war as we've warred in the former. The war is the Lord's. The battle belongs to the Lord. And where we've gone wrong many times is we are hesitant to rise up and uh, uh, fight. And God says, look, this is not your battle. The battle belongs to me. And where a thousand will fa fall on your left side and 10,000 on your right, I am going to move in a way that you've never seen before. I trust this, not the man, I trust the word. I trust what God has stirred up in me. Amen. By the finger of God, God is going to change your destiny. And promotion is coming quick. In other words, God is going to change your heart and desire, and he's going to make it happen in a much quick fashion. It's going to go quickly. And... Uh, the wealth of the sinner is going to be loosed to the church. And God will begin to bring the financial blessing into the house of God.
So church, um, there's one other thing that he didn't speak of, but he did mention this one single word called serpent. We know that the serpent was the deceiving entity in the garden in chapter 3 of Genesis. As this serpent came in, it went to the emotional feminine side of Adam and Eve. Emotions many times can overwhelm and overtake your spirit. And where, you, where we go wrong is we allow emotion to dictate the move of God and the word of God in our lives. So what this Leviathan or this serpent spirit did is it came in and it went into, uh, began to attack the emotional side of these two entities, Adam and Eve. We know that through the scriptures. God began to show me that Leviathan, who Leviathan is a uh, an old monster spirit or uh, dinosaur. We know that the dinosaurs roamed the earth through some of the skeletal remains that uh, archaeologists have been able to put together. I'm not trying to debate whether it's true or not. But what I do see in the Word of God, he talks in Job chapter 38 about this entity called Leviathan. Leviathan was a sea monster, and in some uh, uh, scholars, they call it a crocodile. I'm of the belief that it was a dragon, a fire-breathing dragon. There is uh, a, an insect called the bombardier. Now, what this insect does, it's, it's alive and it's, uh, it's real. And scientists have found this insect. And there's like 42 entities of this insect in the earth. Point is, is that this bombardier, what it does is through the back of its body, in order to push away its enemy or the preying uh, uh, item or, or insect or, or mammal that's going against it, and it blows out a heated fire-like uh, item out of the back of its body. Now, if an insect is capable of that, how much more was a dragon capable? The Bible speaks about this, and as I said, I'm not here to debate that. I'm here to try and give you an idea, an insight that this is fully possible. Well, this spirit it, that uh, is called Leviathan, this, this demonic entity, comes into the body of Christ, comes into the churches, and its disguise comes as a Jezebel spirit. Jezebel is not necessarily female, but emotional. And therefore... I know the spirit of Jezebel. I've dealt with it a multiple amount of times, and I've had to uh, throw it out of the church many times. And what it does is it comes in, and it strives to usurp authority. What usurp is, is it comes alongside the headship, and it tries to align itself to mimic headship, become eventually a mouthpiece for headship, but not necessarily headship. So its activity comes in and tries to overwhelm the direction and movement of the church. Well, this entity operated in uh, Genesis chapter 3 with Adam and Eve, it happened, of course, through Elijah. It happened through David. It, on and on and on. You can see it throughout the scriptures. Again, I'm not trying to bring a, uh, a chorus of action in regard to this uh, uh, Jezebel spirit. But what I am trying to bring to you is the realization 
that we're at war. We are still in battle. We still must be a church of war. Until the Lord tells you to stop warring, you continue to fight the battle. We now have a prayer room that we've accessed in this back quarter. I want you to start going there. If you're in leadership, you have to go there. I don't care who you are, pastor, uh, uh, whatever you are in this church involved in ministry, even if you're in the worship team, anything, you have to start going back there. When you begin to come to my discipleship class, I'm going to be marking you down and I'm going to deal with you. I need you to rise up in authority, power, and position and begin to pray before church starts. Five minutes, 20 minutes, the whole hour, whatever it may be, that, build, that area is going to be open from 9 to 10. So I don't care how you do it, get in there and pray. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. We must be warring. Agreed? Amen. I grew up praying. I grew up praying not just five minutes, but an hour before church. And that was an hour, two hours before church service started. We prayed for one hour, all in ministry. Prayed. Called out to God. Verbalized. So now... I'm bringing a new mandate into the church. Well, I know you pray at your home, you pray at your job, you pray for your food. I know you pray. But I'm expecting you to pray even more so now that I've called this mandate to the church. Why am I doing this? Because of this serpent that wants to come in and stymie the move of God. God's breaking loose in this church. God is bringing revival. And when the door opens for him to speak to me, to start uh, to find a building, that's when we'll do it. But until then, we'll continue here because we have great favor here. Amen. We have brought the spirit of anointing into the body here. Yeah. When you walk in this place, you know that this is a house of God. Amen. So uh, through all of this, I want you to understand that God wants us to be a body of believers that walk in the truth. Amen? Amen. Now, in, a, in a, just a moment, I'm going to play one more video for two and a half minutes. In this video, I'll set the stage. It has to do with uh, some servicemen who had been uh, involved in some corruption, whereas they did not see it as corruption, but they operated in a corrupt fashion that was illegal. And so what they did is they tried to cover up this uh, death of a soldier. And it's in a movie called A Few Good Men. And this scene is a court setting. And the lawyer is trying to get the uh, uh, general to admit that he had uh, called out a, a, uh, a certain warning and called uh, uh, this, I can't remember what specifically it's called, but called it out to get these men to uh, attack another individual at all cost. But nonetheless, the point being is it's about truth. We must walk as children of God in truth. Your Honor, I'd like to ask for a recess. I'd like an answer to the question, Judge. The court will wait for an answer. If Lieutenant Kendrick gave an order that Santiago wasn't to be touched, why did he have to be transferred? Colonel, Lieutenant Kendrick ordered the code red, didn't he? Because that's what you told Lieutenant Kendrick to do. Object! And when it went bad, you cut questions. these guys loose! Your Honor, you had Marcus inside a bony transfer. Your Honor, you doctored the logbook. Damn it, Captain! You coerced the doctor. Consider yourself in contempt. Colonel Jessup, did you order the code red? 
You don't have to answer that question. I'll answer the question. You want answers? I think I'm entitled you to You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Son, we live in a world that has walls, and those walls have to be guarded by men with guns. Who's gonna do it? You? You, Lieutenant Weinberg? I have a greater responsibility than you can possibly fathom. You weep for Santiago and you curse the Marines. You have that luxury. You have the luxury of not knowing what I know, that Santiago's death, while tragic, probably saved lives. And my existence, while grotesque and incomprehensible to you, saves lives. You don't want the truth because deep down in places you don't talk about at parties. You want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. We use words like honor, code, loyalty. We use these words as the backbone of a life spent defending something. You use them as a punchline. I have neither the time nor the inclination to explain myself to a man who rises and sleeps under the blanket of the very freedom that I provide and then questions the manner in which I provide it. I would rather you just said thank you and went on your way. Otherwise, I suggest you pick up a weapon and stand a post. Either way, I don't give a damn what you think you are entitled to. Did you order the code red? I did the job. Did you order the code red? I did. The point here is in John chapter 8, I want you to turn there. We church must do what call, God has called us to do. I'm going to read John chapter 8, verse 44. And I want you to take in what the scripture is telling us. We must do the will and work of God at all cost, but not at the cost of deception. We must stand with honor, truth, and loyalty to the King of Kings. That's your mandate. It's not to me. It's not to each other. It's to God. If you stand in honor, loyalty, and truth to God, you'll never go wrong. John chapter 8, verse 44 says this. You are of your father, the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of it. When you see a platform of lies, you must confront it and deal with it. We as children of God must walk in integrity. God is mandating sometime, well, right now, I want you to look at the scenario of America right now. In this scenario, I want you to understand that we see that we are coming to a point that's called a cancel culture. What a cancel culture is, is they, the entities who are in control of the governmental issues of, of just the laws of the land, are now mandating canceling the church out. Why is that important to us? Simply because if you say something against certain issues, they're going to cancel you. If you walk in a certain way and say certain things, they're going to cancel you. They are now saying, that anyone who voted a certain way are going to be chosen and canceled in America. 
This is the air we're facing in America today. It's gotten so bad that even other governments and nations are coming against this cancel culture in America. I'm not talking politically, church. I'm talking about the father of lies that has come upon the mindset of humankind and encouraged and given them this mindset that what you must do now is cancel certain individuals to get them out of the way. As a matter of fact, why do we not start a concentration camp system to cancel the minds and beliefs of individuals and begin to round them up and give them the ability or, or uh, guide and direct them to change their thinking. This is happening. It's real. I have heard it with my own ears. I have heard people say this. I have heard people talk about it. But you know who they're trying to cancel? The king of kings. You know who's behind it? I'm not saying an individual church. It's the father of lies, according to John chapter 24. Or John chapter 8. The father of lies. Do you know what that means? That means when you think about a father... He is the uh, donor to all deception. You know what his number one uh, agenda is? Pride. You know why pride? Because that's what cast him out of heaven. If you look at the scriptures, you'll see that Satan was cast out of heaven Number one, because of rebellion. And the rebellion was stirred up because of pride. He said, I will lift myself above the Most High. He said that he would take the throne of God away from God himself. Satan forgot, who at that time was called Lucifer, he forgot that he was created by the throne he was trying to take over. This is where we go wrong, church, is we begin to follow an ideology instead of the word of God. God's word is the focal point of who we are as a body of believers. This is the generator of who you are. No man shall come unto the Father except through Jesus Christ. It's generated through the Word of God. This, when you open it up, is the very voice of the Master. When you read a scripture, it begins to invoke in your spirit a new vision and view. That is why it is called the living Bible. Living Bible means that when you read the scriptures, each time you get something different and deeper out of it. That's what's called revelation of the truth. What Jack Nicholson uh, uh, said is you can't handle the truth. Well, I'm telling you what, church, the body can handle the truth. We can take the truth. No matter what accusation that's brought against us, we can stand and speak truth and allow everything to unfold in a way that only God can cause it to unfold. Truth is the essence of mankind's a plumb line for everything we do. It's what you call 
absolute truth. What absolute truth is, is anything that is brought forth that measures to the plumb line of the Word of God. Absolutely. What is absolute truth? Absolute truth is the one thing that says that there is only one name under heaven wherein which you should bow to, and that is Jesus Christ. One name, one name only, absolute truth. Buddha isn't the name. Christianity isn't the name. Uh, the door isn't the name. The road isn't the name. Heaven isn't the name. Uh, uh, an angel isn't the name. Jesus is the only name under heaven wherein which you can get into the avenue and kingdom to live forever and ever with the Almighty. Absolute truth, church. That is how you must operate. And when Jack Nicholson said that, that you can't handle the truth, we can handle it. Bring it on. And the truth is, church, is that we as a body of believers will not accept the cancel culture. I'm not talking about a political arena. I am talking about the Almighty. We will go underground. We will go overground. We will come from all sides and we will reach the masses with the truth yeah. that the only name under heaven wherein you must bow to is Jesus Christ. He's the only truth, he's the only avenue, and he's the only way. This prophetic word that was given to us this morning was purposeful. It was so that you could see that there are other entities in the kingdom of heaven that believe like you and I believe, that walk like you and I walk, that live like you and I live. We must go forward with the word of God. And it says, when he speaks, he speaks lies, the devil. Church, when we speak about things that will bring liberty, powers will, will be those entities that will attack you. Principalities and powers of darkness want to stop the move of the living king. The principalities that are trying to dis cause us not to be one, not to be united, not to run together, not to do the will and work of God. Church, we are a church of disciples. And not because of a man. We are a church of disciples because we want more of God than we, th we can get. We want more and more and more. And I just want to close out today with something that responds to what God is wanting you to be encouraged in. In John chapter 1, verse 17, the Word of God says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Church, you know why we had the law? You know what the purpose of the law of God is? The Ten Commandments is so that we could be revealed sin. Well, that's a new one. What? Yes, God allowed the law to come so that we, you and I could be revealed sin. Why is it that we need to be revealed sin? Because if you don't reveal sin to the body of Christ, they'll think that they're okay. They'll think that they are clean. Church, what the truth does is it brings to you evidence as to what you truly are. And thank you, Jesus that we have him to guide and direct us.
John 14, 6 says this. Jesus said to him, an absolute truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. There's no other way. We have to really convince our loved ones, the lost, that there's only one way. You can ask believers here. They've tried many ways, and it don't work. This is the only way. Ephesians 5, 9 says this. For the Spirit, for the fruit of the Spirit in all is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Amen? Look what he's telling us. For the fruit of the Spirit. And when he talks about the Spirit, he's not talking about your spirit. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. What that means is there's a vine and we are the branches. Jesus is the vine. He is the one that gives us fruitfulness. Through the fruit that Jesus is trying to place inside of each of us is this fruit that he talked about, goodness, righteousness, and truth. God wants you to walk in that right living. How many of you have sinned this week? We all have. We all have somehow, some way, our minds have gone this way or that way, and we walked in an unrighteous fashion. But guess what? Over each and every one of you, if God looks at you, what he sees is a covering. That covering is simply the blood of Jesus Christ. He sacrificed his life on the tree of Calvary so that we could live forever and be cleansed of our sinfulness and wickedness that is inside of us. When we go to get born again, he says that he takes you like a baby. He renews you. You're brand new. You start a new vocabulary. You start a new way of living, a new way of seeing, a new revealing. This is what you become when you become a born-again child of the living God. Brand new, church. Cleansed from all unrighteousness. So I want you to quit going backwards. Quit looking at the old man and the old woman and go forward with the truth that you have been cleansed and you are covered by the blood of the Lamb. When you sin, you do not have to get saved again. You have to repent. You don't have to say, I'm sorry. You have to say, I repent. And what repentance is, is turning completely away from the former and become a brand new entity in Christ. You must ride that rail, church. And in the final scripture is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Be diligent to present yourself. You know what diligence is, church? Practice. It is uh, uh, being willing to pay a price. If you get up every morning at 6 then the diligent individual is going to get up at five and pray. That's what a diligent human being does. And he says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God. He's saying, walk in such a way 
that every waking hour, every move, you're allowing the evidence of the father of lies as it comes to you that you are beginning to skirt it, push it away, living diligently and saying, I'll not succumb to this action that the devil is trying to place upon me. I am going to go forward. I'm going to be diligent. I prayed this morning. God said he'd give me a good day. And it's like Josie tells me after we get into an argument, she says, I don't know about you, but as for me, I'm going to have a good day. <laughs> Oh, well, I guess I'm going to have a good day, too. <laughs> she says it with such authority, I want to smack her. <laughs> but I know that the holiness within me is not allowing such an action. Church, you're going to mess up. You're going to fall on your face. You're going to sin. So what? Get up. Repent. Work to be approved by the living God. And in the final analysis, he says this, a worker, it's not a cuss word, you guys, a worker, a worker, what's a worker? Someone that wakes up in the morning and goes to work, unless you're Pastor Benny. Because that when you wake up, he's coming home after work. But I'm telling you, a worker is an individual that is always operating according to the call and the precepts and the settings that God has given you. If you're retired, what you are as a worker is you got to start praying then. If you're retired, what you are as a worker is you got to start reading your word then. And if you're a worker, you've got to get up earlier and pray and read the word. You need to get the voice of God, and it's only going to come through his voice. The powerful word, the living thing that is sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder, cutting you coming and going. When the Word of God comes in, it blesses and, and institutes you, and it hurts sometimes. Truth hurts, agreed? There's a man whose name was Pastor Bob Enyard, and he said, tell the truth and pay the consequences. Whoa. Now, I'm not talking about going to a woman and saying, yeah, you do look fat in that dress. Not that kind of truth. You say, yes, you're lovely, honey. But the truth I'm talking about is get your heart back in line. No, don't go to the bars. No, stay away. Get rid of your joints. And I'm not talking about the ones on your knees. Stop and think. That's what I'm talking about. But he says, a worker who does not need to be ashamed. There's no shame on you, church. The shame that the devil's trying to put on you, it's a lie. You have repented and you are cleared. You have gotten your heart right. You are cleared. God is your king. He's inside of you. He's made an abode. He rests inside. Therefore, you are cleansed due to it. Amen? Amen. Repentance, church. And in the final word, rightly dividing the word of truth. This morning, church, let's be diligent. Let's walk with the king. Let's do the work of our master. Amen? I'm going to ask you this morning to bow your heads for a moment. Close your eyes. And let's, let's get serious. There's a, some of us aren't sure if we're saved. 
some of us aren't sure if we're right with God. I'll tell you what, this morning, let's establish you are. Let's establish that. With your eyes closed and your heart open, let's establish that you're saved. Therefore, I'm going to set a platform for you of salvation. I'm going to ask you to give your life to Christ if you don't have him as your Lord and Savior and you're not sure. And if that's you, I'm going to ask you this morning to pray with me. You can say it slightly under your breath, but I want you to be verbal about it. And the reason we need the verbal communication is so the father of lies can hear it. Let's beat him today and establish our salvation. Say this with me this morning, if you want to give your life to Christ and establish your salvation. Say, Dear Lord, I admit I'm a sinner. I ask Jesus, come into my heart, save me, change me, set me free from the bondages of sin, death, and hell. Be my God, and I will be your servant. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.